Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, I have this wonderful privilege of uh, interviewing men and women whose hearts and minds were touched by the Holy Spirit for a deeper walk with Christ, and often that brings them uh, to a place they never anticipated, which is the beauty of this Catholic Church. For others, it's what we call a reversion. It brings them back. Our guest tonight, we use the term revert back, but it is exactly right. It's going to have some twists and turns, and we'll find out about that. Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. Father Hezekiah. Such a blessing to be with you today, it's Marcus. It's wonderful. To, yeah. You know, I, I've heard about the institute that you started, but I don't know a lot about it, and that's my fault. Mea culpa, because it that's sounds okay. so awesome. And I'm really excited. Uh, a father is the founder of the Institute for Catholic Culture. Uh, Institute of Catholic Culture dot org is your that's website. Right. So I can't wait till we get to that. But that's later in the program. Let me get out of the way. And uh, I, I'm guessing that when you began your life, you would not have thought you'd be sitting here with a blue cassock no, my, and your cross. <laughs> my story is very much uh, follows the lines of, of God's <laughs> God's path. And he, as we say, <laughs> writes straight with crooked lines. It's a it's an interesting an interesting journey, but uh, but before journeying home, the Lord um, the Lord was was working in a way that was unseen to me and so many, um, okay. and uh, really really while well, the hand of God as I look back now I can see the hand of God through my life. I also see um, how the devil is, is is really working to separate us from the Lord. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I grew up, I grew up in California, which, which tells the whole story, um, and, uh, and with, with, with all that that means, um, I grew up in a house that was unfortunately, well, my father was, was raised Catholic, but, um, but I was not baptized till I was 10 years old. Hmm. So for the first part of my life, we weren't really a church going family. Um, and uh, now that's interesting for a father to be, even though he's not actively Catholic, still to not baptize your child means he'd really right. gone a long way from the faith. That's right. In fact, my older siblings uh, had been baptized, but my brother, my older brother, and I had not. <laughs> um, and uh, he's a doctor, and uh, I think very much, I think, uh, kind of followed the way. There were there were other things that took a priority in his life, um, at least in those years. Yeah. And, um, and that very much affected our family. My parents divorced when I was six years old. And, uh, and three years later, my mom passed away when I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, and those years, I look back on, they very much affect me today. Uh, wow. I miss my mom terribly. I miss my mom terribly. Um, but I, I will say that her, her death, um, though tragic, uh, terrible uh, and, and very much has impacted my life, the divorce of my parents was more tragic hmm. because here two people decided who had, who had, had been given by God for, for my formation and uh, upbringing made a decision hmm. uh, no longer to, in a sense, fulfill that role together. Um, and I know, you know this is true for so many that, that divorce just uh, it, it, it destroyed our family. In so many ways, and and even today, we're we're feeling the impact of that, yeah. um, and uh, and but through that, God always has a plan, um, and He brought my father back to the faith in those years, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I remember him even going to, you know, four square churches and and and, and businessmen, Christian businessmen associations, things like that, uh, in those years, and. Um, that After was the my divorce. Did you go, were you staying with your mother or your with father? my mother exactly? But he would come and pick us up, yeah. and then uh, we'd go for the weekend with him. And that's where you know I could see. I look back on it now. I didn't quite understand it then, but he was going through his own journey home. Yeah. Okay. Um, I remember driving in his car. We had, he had a, a gold Volvo that he had purchased, and um, he put a magnet sticker on the side of it: "Free Bibles, just ask." And I remember being so embarrassed as a kid, you know, the people would honk their horn, pull us over, and he'd give out a Bible from the back of the car. So and he had gone through a real conversion. He really of had. Some, wow. He really yeah. had. Um, you know, that, <laughs> that experience, uh, seeing that generosity which he had 
Um, and then uh, maybe a few years later, sitting down with him uh, to write our tithe checks. Uh, at, when when uh, he received his paycheck, he would gather the family around the table. This is after my mom had passed away. And, um, and he would have us write the check and, and choose, you know, portion to go to the parish uh, that we were going to, the church we were going to, and to other charities. Um, you know, he allowed us a role in that, and that was so important to me. Wow. Yeah, as I look back on it. Um, but you know, Marcus, being baptized at 10 years old, um, it was too late. It was too late. And, um, mm-hmm. and for those parents that are watching to realize how important those first years in the, in the home are, mm-hmm. uh, how formative they are for a child, and uh, in the years following, you know, so was your yeah. baptism uh, uh, was it in a context of baptismal regeneration, or was it a baptism as a symbol of your faith, or how did you understand it when you were baptized? Well, by was then, a Catholic. Yeah, it was a Catholic baptism. Oh, okay. By then, my father had come back to the faith. Okay, gotcha. Um, and um, and started teaching us. You know, pulled out the old Baltimore Catechism, okay. and 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 he and he taught us. Um, and uh, and and he remarried, and and really the the home became a Catholic home. Okay. Um, but uh, so when you say it's too late, we, we're yeah. talking about the, the graces that come with baptism and the necessity of those also during those early formative years. I would say it was too, it was too late, not in the sense that I didn't receive the graces of baptism, but it was it was too late because I'd been impacted for the first 10 years of my life by secularism. And not that we grew up in a bad home, but uh, through the divorce and all of the things that came with that. Um, really the destruction of the foundation which a child just needs so badly mm-hmm. and the affirmation of your parents and so forth um, all of that was was ripped apart yeah. um, and uh, and so by the time I was baptized um, I w- this, there was so much baggage I was carrying in those early years and uh, and and my and my brothers and my sister and so forth that had gone through this um, so, you know, the, 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 my teenage years, very much California, I was a California teenager. And while my dad and my, my, my uh, stepmother did the best they could, um, I, I, I very much wandered away from, from Christ and the church. Um, and while I was being taught, I was enrolled in a Catholic school, elementary school and high school. Um, uh, and while I was taught the faith, intellectually, uh, it never really took root in my heart mm-hmm. and in the moral life. And so while I was, you know, go, go to church dutifully with my parents and so forth, um, I, I wandered very much far in my heart from the Lord. Um, Sometimes I wonder when, when people go through that, like you said, all the baggage is there, that the learning of this faith that doesn't touch your heart, is, it's a way of learning to, to have a nice looking shell. That's right. That's what it was. It was a shell. It was a shell. And I was, I found myself uh, years after I realized how empty I was inside. Mm. Um, And I say I went to Catholic school, but even in those years, you know, in the, in the, in the eighties or early nineties, the church was undergoing such a a crisis. Um, Not the same crisis we're undergoing today, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I remember we enrolled in Catholic school soon after my mom passed away and I moved in with my, with my father, there were three nuns in the school. Two of them had taken the habit off. One of them had it on. By the time I graduated in eighth grade, they were all gone. Yeah. So, uh, so really I was living through a, a, a crisis in the church and I didn't know it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's one of the, also an ingredient in this, the, 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 my early formation, but also during that time that, uh, that ended up producing in me, as, as you say, rightly, a, sh- a kind of a, a shell of, uh, I was Catholic. Uh, I guess in some ways I believed to a certain extent, um, the doctrines I had been taught. Um, but it had never, it had never taken root. I, I remember Father Groeschel told me one time, he says, um, that, that the, the, the ideas of the intellect are meant to 
be placed into the fire of the heart and become incense to God. Um, and he always had a beautiful way of speaking. And, um, That's a great, yeah, praise God. Yeah, so, but it had never been put there. It had never been put yeah. there. Um, Our guest is Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. Um, so you, you basically said you were getting the shell of the teaching of the church, uh, even the externals of the church. So maybe on the outside, you look like a good Catholic kid, but what was going on, on the inside? Inside was there a belief in God? There was an intellectual adherence, okay. maybe. <laughs> yes, okay. it was there. It was there. Thank God it was there. And really the gift of my, of my father. And I wouldn't say there was nothing inside. I think it was those, those moments of him handing out that, those free Bibles, having us write the, the tithe checks. It was his love, not so much the information, but it was, it was a witness of his love, the witness of his charity, his generosity to others that, uh, was, that, that really came back and became uh, influential. Well, there were seeds there. There were, there were seeds, seeds, definitely yeah, planted. Right. But as I say, California teenager, <laughs> I, was, uh, I think my story would make uh, St. Augustine blush um, at 18 and 19, 20 years old. Um, and, and of course, after I graduated from high school, then I stopped going to church. There was, there just wasn't, there wasn't anything. But my father always, every time I saw him, every time I, I saw him, he always told me the truth in love. Yeah. Every single phone call, every visit home, he would say, it's time that you come back to church. Mm. Um, and uh, um, those words just rang in my ears because, um, because I was trying everything the world had to offer. But the one thing I had not tried was Christ and a relationship with Him. Um, and, uh, you know, at 21 years old, I found myself very much lonely, uh, a lonely person. Um, I met a Jehovah's Witness, not knocking on my door, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, I met a Jehovah's Witness who, um, a, a beautiful young lady, and very much fell in love. Um, she had been disfellowshipped and, from the Watchtower organization, and I had basically been self-excommunicated, okay, <laughs> by choice. Um, and uh, she still held on to the intellectual things in which she had been formed, and I, and I did also. Um, and uh, we began to talk, and she challenged me for the first time in my life of what I believed about Christ, what I believed about the church, uh, and so forth, what I believed about the scriptures. And that began a journey which um, intellectually did not take long. I was, uh, I had started a landscaping business and so I was self-employed and I was very interested in her. <laughs> I went home and uh, didn't go to work the next day. I went to the library and began to read. Uh, my father had given me a, a, a book that has remained an important book in my life and uh, put out by, by Penguin Classics, uh, Early Christian Writings, The mm -hmm. Apostolic yeah. Fathers. I'm sure you're yeah. quite familiar. Uh, and I began to read the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. And I discovered in his story someone who had something worth dying for. Hmm. And I found in my life at that point that I didn't have much worth living for. And what a difference that hmm. was. Um, and that began a journey. Um, as I say, my father was always there, whether physically present or in my mind, it's time to go back to church. And so I did. What was the, uh, a little question, the, the meeting of this Jehovah Witness girl, uh, did that draw you in that direction or was that just another spark that awakened you to Christianity in general in a sense? Well, I remember the conversation quite well in uh, sitting in a park um, and, I, and I said, well, let's begin to investigate these questions that, that, that we're, we're talking about. Um, and uh, if the watchtower is right, I'll become a Jehovah's Witness. 
if the Catholic Church is right, you become a Catholic. If they're both wrong, then we'll, we'll, we'll find our way together. Um, and uh, I was open. I, I was open to, uh, to the truth. And it didn't take long to discover that truth, that the early church was indeed Catholic. Uh, the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, the witness of, as I say, of St. Polycarp, uh, were, were amazing. And those stories have stayed with me to this day. Um, that these early Christians were not crazy. They were well respected, as St. Polycarp was. Uh, but they had seen something, and they weren't willing to deny it. They weren't, they didn't, they weren't willing to lie about what they had seen. Um, and they simply gave witness to that. They didn't force anybody to join them. They, they gave witness to what they had seen. The apostles gave witness to what they had seen. And they had seen, uh, they had seen Jesus rise from the dead, and that transformed their life. And it was a transformation that I was so hungry for because I was made for it. And, uh, and I later came to know that all of us, obviously, made for that relationship with Jesus Christ to be transformed into his image and likeness. And I began there, the seed began to sprout. And I discovered a joy and a happiness, which I never knew before. The world had, you know, try this, try this, try this, and, and to find happiness. And nothing produced the happiness that I hungered for. Uh, and there was, there was, you know, f momentary euphoria, momentary ful fulfillment. But it was, it was the trick of the evil one uh, to trade eternal happiness for momentary excitement and so forth like that. Um, and, uh, and that seed began to sprout. But I mean, at this point in time, it's just your private reading, right? That's right. Other that's early fathers right. and really being that's drawn right. by and that. I, but I, I, I did return. I, I went back to church and I went to confession. All right. um, but like the, uh, like the prodigal son, <laughs> it was a long journey home. Um, and uh, it took me, I would say, four years. Um, I guess in some ways I'm still digging myself out of the moral quagmire that I had made of my life. Um, and, but it certainly took four, four to five years. And those four years, I was accompanied on that journey by a, a wonderful priest. Um, and I don't know today if he really understands how impactful he was, but he heard my confession over and over and over again. And like a loving father, um, he never tired of hearing the same sins. And, um, and I, I later, I met an elderly priest that, that uh, told me in confession one time that uh, he says, well, thank God that, um, that you're not inventing any new sins. <laughs> Isn't that true with so many of us? We repeat the same things, but you know, the, um, in, the, uh, in the Byzantine tradition, uh, we, call, we call the Lord our, the heavenly physician. And the, the uh, a physician works carefully. He doesn't go in and start whacking limbs off and you know, the patient will die. And this is exactly what the Lord was doing. He was working on my heart slowly, carefully. Um, but like a, like a, I guess like a, a, a sculptor, you know, chipping away at the stone um, to reveal his image and likeness and, uh, and, and, and to give me back the life that he wanted for me. Okay. So, so you said the, those four years, uh, did it, you mean that those four years of, again, you got the shell and you're trying to get the inside matching what it maybe That's looks right. like on the outside, but when you came back with four years, are you now solid in your childhood faith? Is that what you mean when you come back? That's right. I, 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 returned, I returned to the faith and, um, and uh, um, decided to... Uh, sell my landscaping business, uh, or basically just give it up. I, I owned a nursery at, at that uh, point, and I sold off everything. I packed my bags in my pickup truck, and I decided to leave California. And I moved across the country to Virginia, and I enrolled at Christendom College um, and began a new chapter in my life of, uh, of, um, of something that I didn't know before, even during those four years. And that was an experience of lived Christianity. 
Um, and there at, at Christendom, as there's a, you know, a handful of really faithful Catholic colleges uh, in the United States today. And they're oftentimes accused of being a, a bubble, a Catholic bubble. Well, it is. <laughs> uh, Christendom College was a, was a bubble. But I would say it was a bubble in exactly the way it needed to be. You know, we, we send soldiers, we don't send them directly into battle. They go into training camp yeah. first. Yeah. They shoot with rubber bullets or whatever. And this is what, this is what that time, it was a four year retreat for me <laughs> where I discovered Christ, um, Christ as the, um, the one who was the author of history. He was uh, and is the wisdom of the philosophers. Uh, he, he's the revelation of theology. He is the center of every aspect of our life. And it was there at Christendom College that I discovered that for the first time. The faith not is something here. Uh, that's an important part of it. Mm -hmm. But as, it, as Father Groeschel said, as it takes root and then the fire begins and, and uh, to learn it, to begin to live a life of that offering of incense, that offering of your life to Christ, to see Him in all aspects of our life um, and to begin to live the Eucharistic life. Um, and it was there at Christendom College that I would say I, I first discovered that to become a Eucharistic Christian um, and, uh, and to develop a sense of wonder, of desire, um, and a, dis a discovery of true joy and happiness, which I never knew before. Before we talk about the, the journey of the Eastern Church, um, you talk about the Eucharistic Christian. Would you say that that, during your time at Christendom, was solidifying why you're Catholic as opposed to anything else? I mean, yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, it doesn't sound like your journey particularly went with your, you had a, a, a Jehovah Witness trying to pull in that direction, but you didn't like your father to test out four square gospel and some of those. No, others. I never, no, I would never went down that road, but, uh, but my, but in my high school years, my father took refuge, refuge in California, <laughs> <laughs> refuge in a little Byzantine chapel um, in, in San Luis Obispo, California, St. Anne's, and it was a little tiny mission uh, at that time, uh, maybe 20 people going to church. And I first experienced Eastern Christianity uh, there um, that would later uh, really speak to my spiritual life. But really, it was, it was at, at, at Christendom College that I um, put, I say, the, the roots hmm. started to grow, um, not necessarily, you know, East versus West, or Roman Catholic versus, it, it, but deeply in, in Christ, as I said, as the author of history of all aspects of our life. Um, and there, yes, I truly say became Catholic in the, in the proper sense of that word. And I realized um, how, what Jesus had done for us in establishing the church and ultimately in sharing his life with us. Mm -hmm. So while I was you know, passing tests and learning, the, learning all of the things that I needed to learn in college, uh, more importantly, I, I, I met Christ and I fell in love with him. Um, and, and that relationship of love began to, to really grow. And then as, as, as we read in scripture, the two become one flesh. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something I didn't, understand before and it was something there at Christendom College that became so important to my life. Did, uh, did your sense of call to the priesthood begin before your movement to Eastern Catholicism or vice versa? It, 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 it did, it did. Um, I, I uh, remember um, back in those years of, of rediscovery of the faith that uh, before I went on and, and, and to study at Christendom, um, I see, I went as I was 25 when I enrolled, I was okay. an older student. So in those years, I do remember, you know, Lord, I remember praying that prayer, Lord, if you want me to become a priest, because I was going to daily liturgy to go, going to mass every day and, and going to confession regularly. And of course, the old ladies at church saw me there and they would come up and say, oh, you're going to be a priest. You're going to be a priest. <laughs> and I used to laugh at them and they had no idea how bad my life really was. <laughs> um, I was going to 
church every day and going to confession almost as, as frequently because I was just, it was every time I stepped out of that church, it was, uh, it was a disaster. It was a problem. Um, but uh, I gave the Lord a choice in those days. I'll become a priest or I'll keep doing, you know, living here. And, um, and it wasn't until I, I said, whatever you want to do with my life, that really he was able to take the reins. Um, I, I started teaching catechism at the Carmel Mission in Carmel, California, and uh, I discovered there... This is um, after Christendom? No, no, this is before. Oh, I'm okay, sorry, gotcha, I'm sorry. Gotcha, this okay. just in the years, maybe in the year just beforehand. Okay. Um, I started to teach catechism. I was approached, uh, and, you know, I was not the right person to be teaching the kids. I, my, my life was still very much in disarray. Um, and so I agreed to be an assistant. I'll, you know, I'll stay on the side, pass out papers and things. <laughs> but um, the teacher, who I've stayed in contact with these many years, um, ended up two weeks after we began the, the, uh, the, the season, the, the year of catechism, she had to leave and go take care of her daughter who was sick and left me alone. <laughs> and, uh, and I discovered there something I never knew before, and that was a, a gift God had given me for teaching <laughs> and a love for teaching. Um, and, uh, and there it was at Carmel Mission, I would, I would pray in front of the, the tomb of Winnipeg Rosera um, before going and teaching. And, and uh, what a transformative time that was because I began to love to talk about the faith more than doing my landscaping business. And I really enjoyed landscaping, I, I, uh, you know, but, but uh, no, I, I loved to teach. And it was really there that I said, what do I want to do in my life? And, uh, and that really was a factor, a big factor in going to Christendom College to study, uh, simply to go back. And my plan was to go back and teach fifth grade catechism <laughs> class and restart my landscaping business. But, but no, God had another plan, and that was one step along the journey as he was kind of taking my hand and walking me back to, to where I needed to be. All right, that's a good place to pause, Father. Uh, we'll come back just a moment with more of Father Hezekiah's story. Before we take a break, I just want to remind those of you who watch the program, you know that my main job is a, as a president and founder of the Coming Home Network International. If you're on a journey like Father's was, uh, you're wondering who to talk to. We'd love to have you contact the Coming Home Network International. We've got a website with over a thousand conversion stories, and we're here to stand beside you as you discover the beauty of the church. You can contact us at chnetwork.org. I'll see you after the break. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. All right, Father, we've got you, we've got you at uh, Christendom, a great place to land, a wonderful school. That's right. A wonderful, wonderful school. And uh, uh, I miss visiting there when I have, because uh, it's a great environment. Uh, and you've already got the tug. Well, you didn't go there to become a priest, but you were no. going there to solidify your faith. But there at the process, you, it gets nurtured. That's right. It was nurtured. That's a, that's a good way to describe it. The, 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 it was growing, as you were saying, a seed earlier. Um, and, uh, um, and really, I can just continue that, that, that journey of reading the fathers, reading the, uh, the great wisdom of uh, the philosophers, the, the great saints. And, uh, and, and, the, and the faith really blossomed and, and, and opened up uh, for me. Um, I met my, my future wife. Uh, we became friends, uh, four years, very good friends, um, and uh, eventually I graduated from, from Christendom and was married. Um, and it was really during those years at Christendom that I, that I returned to, I guess in my heart, to that little mission in San Luis Obispo, but, <laughs> but, uh, but to a church in McLean, Virginia, Holy Transfiguration, uh, Greek Catholic Church, Melkite Greek Catholic Church, and um, and really discovered a whole another aspect of the faith, a uh, very deep and beautiful aspect and rich aspect of the faith 
Um, I was reading in many of the books we were studying, this is the way the early church was. This is, and so we're describing early liturgy and, and spirituality and so forth. And it was there at Holy Transfiguration, uh, Father Joseph Francavilla, Father Charles of Booty, that I was, um, that I, that I said, wait a minute, it's not just in a book, it's alive <laughs> and well. And, um, and so I, I then uh, started attending church there regularly and made a, a spiritual home there that ended up being my spiritual home um, and eventually ordained as a, as, a, as a deacon and priest in the Melkite Greek Catholic Church. All right. I remember not long after I came into the church, a, a, a Greek Catholic friend, um, Byzantine Catholic friend, uh, gave me a book, said, you might enjoy this, a book called The Philokalia. Uh -huh, yes, that's right. I mean, what a wonderful Amazing. Yes. Uh, collection of prayers and, and right. wisdom of the that's fathers. Right. That's, that, that's the thing. Our, our church, our, the Catholic Church is so rich. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about, um, about uh, God's creation and why he made variety with you know, so many different kinds of flowers. Because creation itself, itself is supposed to be a revelation of him. And no one limited physical created thing could properly reveal uh, the Lord himself. And so he made variety within creation yeah. as an aspect of, of his own revelation. And that's true within the church. You know, for your, for your viewers, I want to be very clear that, uh, the, that many people don't realize the Catholic Church is, is a family of, uh, family of families, if you will. Yeah. Um, and within, the, within the, the, the arms of the church, um, is every type of people uh, and, and beautiful way of life conformed to the ways of the Lord. And so no matter where you go in the world, that culture is cultivated by Christianity mm -hmm. and it rises up and becomes that beautiful incense as Father Groeschel talked about, it would be incense before the Lord. And so the, the, uh, the, the Eastern Catholic churches are, are part of that Catholic communion, uh, fully Catholic um, oh. and, uh, and apostolic in that the uh, founded by the apostles themselves and not it shouldn't be uh, like two people standing across a room looking at each other yelling at each other trying to say why my tradition's better than yours is not the point but but learning from each other appreciating whether it's, uh, sharing uh, our heritages and traditions and one of the things as I was coming into the church and I came in from the total Protestant background 40 years Presbyterian pastor, total Protestant mm -hmm. culture, no Catholic culture at all. And then coming into the church and trying to, whoa, understand this. And I remember at one point in terms of understanding the unique differences, I don't want to use the word differences, the unique gifts, my Latin right side was helping me discover the, uh, the rosary and the Hail Mary prayer and understand the great history and depth of that. The Eastern side was helped me understand the Jesus prayer mm -hmm. and the power of that, mm -hmm. you know, and putting those together, the power of that. Yeah. You know, it's like sitting at the Thanksgiving table with our families and we're all different, uh, but God willing, God willing, that family is united as one. The blood is the same blood flowing through our veins, um, but, but we're different. And it's that, that um, I, I remember a, a, a priest told me one time, um, unity is not uniformity and difference is not division. We can be different um, and, and still be part of that beautiful bouquet of, of God's creation. You know, um, yeah. It was really there at, in those years at Christendom that, that, that a, another chapter of my life opened. Um, and that was this, a further love of, of teaching. I, I started teaching a Bible study there mm. with the students. I was an older student and, and while they were, you know, a lot of them, well, more serious about the faith than I had been. Um, nevertheless, coming back at 25 years old, I was pretty, I, I was quite serious in college and really wanted to dive into the scriptures, the word of God. Um, and we started a Bible study together and I learned there that um, I not only loved teaching children, but I liked teaching adults actually more. Um, and uh, I remember being an older student at the end of the semester, you know, the parents would come back and pick up the kids um, and uh, take to take them home. And there was one phrase that just kept being repeated to me. 
I mean, I would they would come and pick the kids up, and I would usually step to the side and talk with them because it's nice to have a conversation with, with some older folks. And, um, and they said, you know, I wish I had received the education that you're receiving. And I heard that over and over and over again. And, and I began to ask myself a question. Why not? Why is it that we are hiding, in a sense, uh, this great treasure that I had discovered in these years from the vast majority of adult Catholics? Mm. How, why is it that, 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 that the things which became so meaningful in my life the things that still nour nourish me today were virtually unknown. If you say St. Polycarp to most Catholics, eh, maybe yeah. they heard his name in, 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 at Mass or something, but being able to, to talk about these, these great men and women that have gone before us. And, um, and, and, and I, I, so I, I asked the question, why not? And, and that was a question which remained with me after I graduated. Mm -hmm. Uh, completed a master's uh, in, in theology and uh, was hired at a parish as a director of religious education. And while I was working on the catechetical program for the kids, I also began to establish a catechetical program for the parents and grandparents, the adults in the parish, which became known uh, later as the Institute of Catholic Culture. Uh, which became really my life's work. <laughs> I, I remember when I was newly ordained as a Congregationalist before I, I became Presbyterian, one of the first things I did at the church was the, 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 the adults wanted me to teach a class like you're talking about. And I said, well, what do you want to teach? She said, well, can you teach us on the history of the church? And I realized they knew nothing about the history. And then I realized I knew nothing yeah. about the history because as a Protestant, I had a truncated view of church history. Yeah. And, and I look back on that as maybe a seed to eventually to Catholicism, but I also look back on that as the dearth of knowledge mm. that so many Christians have about early church fathers, about the Middle Ages, about, about all how the faith was passed on, about the different traditions within Catholicism, East and West, the great treasures that are there. That's right. And they're hungry, like sponges. I think they're hungry. Yeah. And, you know, I look at this not as information about the faith, but as an invitation but from God. He has worked through the lives of so many countless men and women that have gone before us. And we fail oftentimes to see his uh, hand, his work, his fingerprint in our own life because we are ignorant of how he has worked in the lives of so many others. It's only when we begin to see that, that we can discover how he's working in our life and become uh, very much attentive and, 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 and live in that communion on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, and, and, and to learn those things and the, the insights of the philosophers and, and Catholic history, theology, it broadens the faith and allows us to become uh, so deeply rooted that when the storms and challenges of this life come, and they come, mm -hmm. whether it be the crisis that we're dealing with now in the church, the personal crises that we go through in our own life, illnesses, challenges in relationships, it's those deep roots that keep the tree strong. And uh, when the winds are blowing, we, uh, we become uh, like, a, like an oak tree. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I discovered very much there at Christendom and wanted so much to give to others. As my, I learned from my father in those early years about the, the, the joy of giving, um, whether it be writing a tithe check or giving a Bible, or you know, I remember him opening up, giving uh, whole boxes of fruit that he would find on sale to the Catholic families that had kids and so forth. And this, this joy of giving, and, um, and, I, and I wanted to dedicate my life to giving not just boxes of fruit, but to giving Christ who had become a transformative person, a real person in my life who I was journeying with. Um, and as I said, it transformed my life, gave me a joy I never knew before. <laughs> and because of that joy that I received, I wanted to give that to others. You had mentioned earlier that you've been baptized at 10 and it was late. I remember when I was visiting Germany one time and I saw some five-year-old German kids and those kids were speaking fluent German. 
mean, they must be unbelievably intelligent that they can speak yeah. fluent German. I yeah. can't speak German. But it was obviously it was a part of the culture they brought up, and it was natural for them to speak German. I mean, that's about the necessity of our young people catching culture young. Yes. Is that a part of your work? Yeah, oh, absolutely. You know, we, we, um, we oftentimes focus on the teachings of the church, the doctrines of the church. Um, and, uh, um, and, and those are important things. Um, but eventually those doctrines have to take root in a personal relationship. We need to learn how you said is speaking in, in German or in French or uh, living a culture. We need to rediscover Catholic culture. And that is rediscovering how to live as a Christian. You know, there's a, there's a Catholic way to eat. There's a Catholic way to dance. There's a Catholic way to drink wine. There's a Catholic way to live. And so many of our people uh, don't realize that and are, uh, and are therefore unable to really live their faith. They punch a time card, they fulfill their obligation and so forth. But eventually it's not enough. And so many people leave the Catholic Church because they're looking for something more. When the very thing in front of them has everything that they're, that they're looking for, but they're not able to see it. My mission in life has been to invite others to learn how to live again. To rediscover the life which God wants for us. And we discover that life, uh, like I said, through learning how he has interacted in the lives of others, to seeing him as the center of history, as the center of our life, as we are part of that story of God. Um, and, uh, and, and, and when I see others that discover that, lived Christianity, I discover and find someone who finds true joy in their life. I remember hearing a story after World War II uh, I wasn't there, but I'm hearing the story about when our soldiers were visiting some of these countries that had uh, been freed after the war, visiting a church, and as they watched people come in, the people would walk down a hallway, and at some point in the hallway, they would genuflect, and then walk on. And they would come in and genuflect, and he noticed this after a while, there was nothing there. And he asked them, well, why do you do that? He says, well, before the Nazis came and took everything away. Our great shrine was there. Yeah. So yeah. in the outside, we'd see them do, we didn't understand why they're doing it, but they remembered. That's right. There's a culture that they were preserving. Yes. But people on the outside didn't understand what it's about. So we have to share the reasons why. We have to, we have to re rediscover uh, our own life. We have to remember. You know, there's a sin of forgetfulness today. And it's a sin of forgetfulness in so many aspects in which we've forgotten that our whole life is a gift from God. Um, and, uh, and, and, and really, in, in establishing the Institute of Catholic Culture, um, that's been our goal, is to give people their Catholic memory back, their Catholic speech back, um, to rediscover uh, what it means to, to think as a Catholic again, to be able to read as a Catholic again. Um, to remember why people used to, when they pass a church, they would cross themselves. That's right. That's right. In so many small ways, apparently small ways, the faith was, uh, was very much a lived faith in those generations that have come before us. Today, sadly, um, it's missing in, for so many. But it's there and available if only we would discover it again, if only we would read uh, St. Polycarp and, and learn uh, our history um, to be able to, uh, to read uh, uh, Socrates, learn from great men and women who have made the journey of faith, um, to be able to be put back into that family in which we're meant to live. Tell us specifically, I'll give you a, a permission for a short infomercial. Tell the people, I mean, <laughs> about the Institute. I mean, what, what's it about and what, yeah. what they off, you offer? And sure, sure. Well, we very much offer what I've been talking about, and that is a, a, a Catholic liberal arts education, a, a, a kind of a, a classic Catholic education, an experience and an opportunity for people to experience what I experienced at Christendom College and to be able to do it for free. Because, you know, Jesus, uh, Jesus never charged anybody to learn, you know, to, to hear his homilies. Um, and it was there, as I said, at, at Christendom, I heard so many people, I wish I received the education you're receiving. I said, why not? 
Why can't we bring Socrates, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, why can't we bring Catholic history back to our people so that they are given the tools necessary to live their life as a Catholic, to put down those deep roots? And so that's what we've done. And, uh, and, and so I've seen the transformation of so many people's lives that have had a certain goal in life. I, one couple, um, Tom and, and, and Anne Marie McNew down in, in Texas, um, have started a, a, a Catholic radio uh, channel down there, uh, Armor of God Catholic Radio. Here they had, they had, had gone through their whole life saving money to retire. But when they found out the, the beauty of the faith, when they tasted, they came to the Institute of Catholic Culture and they tasted. And that seed that was planted there has become so beautiful. They took their retirement money <laughs> and they established a Catholic radio station so that they could give the joy that they have discovered to others. Uh, it's like that wildfire that just won't, can't be put out. Um, and, uh, and I would in, encourage your, your participants to uh, your viewers, check us out at instituteofcatholicculture.org and they can participate f no matter where they are. We have, uh, we have people that are participating in the, in the, in the courses from, uh, from all over the United States, all over the world, to be able to uh, really dive deeply into the faith um, and experience the fullness, the richness of the gift which God has given us. Uh, when I think about we as a church going through difficult times, um, in fact, times for many people that are really wondering, do I want to stay here? Do I need to start looking elsewhere? Why is it that having this cultural foundation is one of the great bulwarks that we need to help us through difficult times. You know, to be, to, be, to be rich in history is to make one so strong. You know, the crisis we're going through in the church, while it is historic, while it is terrible, uh, nevertheless, the church has undergone these crises before. Um, I was just reading St. Peter Damien, who, who was talking, you know, the, the, a, a thousand years ago about the very crisis that we're facing today, not prophetically in the sense that, uh, or toward the future at all, but, but, but prophetically then, telling the truth about the situation going on then. You know, Christ established a church as, as, as uh, the Pope has loved to use that image, uh, uh, a hospital. We shouldn't be surprised to discover sick people there. The apostles themselves were sick men. Uh, one of them turned Christ in. You know, another denied him three times. We shouldn't be surprised when we see people that are sick in the church. The question is whether they're willing to allow the heavenly physician to work upon them. Um, and we see these, 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 these situations, these terrible situations in the church as uh, opportunities for Christ's healing. And may he heal those who are ill, uh, not yeah. to condemn them, but to heal them. That's his ministry, and it's our ministry also, not to go and, and leave the hospital, but when we, when we become healthy again, to turn and minister to those that are sick in the church. Yeah, yeah, we think about the days of, of uh, the plagues. Uh, it was pretty a nasty time. Yes. Um, and you could have decided that my only answer is to get out of here. But there were people that said, no, they need me here to help yeah. the sick, help the wounded. You know, this is, the, this is the healing part of history, that it helps us become so deeply rooted to understand what's happened before and how, as I said multiple times, how God works among men. We begin to recognize, and you were talking about how important the Psalms are to you um, uh, before. We hear, this is, this is the story of David's life, and we begin to learn how God worked in his life and then we discover how he's working in our own, but only if we're, we're steeped deeply in what he has done before us. <laughs> we have an email, Joan from Washington. And she writes, my husband returned to his Catholic roots a few years ago. He still seems to be lukewarm about his faith though, and hasn't made a genuine effort to really learn what the church teaches about issues. How can I encourage him to take his faith seriously and appreciate the awesome gift of being Catholic. Yeah, well, Joan, uh, <clears throat> in my experience, everybody enjoys something in life. 
as everybody's interested in something. <laughs> and when you understand that Christ is the center of all of those things, then we're going to find him wherever we turn. This is why it's important that in our education in the faith, we're not just being educated in the things we think we're interested in, but in being well-rounded in all aspects of the faith. At the Institute of Catholic Culture, um, I, I would encourage Joan and, and, and our other uh, viewers today to, uh, to take a look in Catholic history, philosophy, theology, catechetics, sacred scripture, in virtually every aspect of our life, Catholic politics, um, that we have uh, real solid educators. Marcus, you, you, you're one of our, our teachers there and at the Institute. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, to be able to touch people, to meet people where they are, uh, maybe someone's interested in, in, in the Crusades. Um, maybe someone is interested in, in these various aspects. And it's there they come, ah, I want to learn a little history about the Crusades. And they discover, number one, a teacher who is a believer. And they discover Christ there. Maybe they weren't coming for that. Maybe they were coming simply because they were interested in a history talk or an aspect of politics. But we give them, they come for that, and we give them Jesus Christ. All right, we've got another email, Andrew from Grand Rapids. In Father's opinion, how did the Protestant Reformation influence East Catholics. Are these ways different than how the Reformation affected Latin Rite Catholics in the West? Well, certainly the, um, certainly the Protestant uh, Revolution impacted the entire church, but uh, it was a problem which took place primarily in the West. Its impact was not felt as strongly in the East, um, mm -hmm. which is, which is uh, I can say is, is, a, is a blessing in so many ways that we can see a form of apostolic Christianity that is uh, certainly not in reaction to uh, in reaction to what Luther was teaching. Um, and, but at the same time, uh, Islam was born in the East, <laughs> and so we see very much a church impacted by that reality. Just as much as my childhood was so important in who I became and who I am today, for good and for bad, so the history of the church is, is similar. I have one question for you. I know a lot of, especially from Protestant background and, and Latin Catholic, one aspect of Eastern Catholicism that is a puzzlement to many is the iconography. Can you talk about the beauty of that culture? Sure. sure. The icons are, the icons are, uh, are, are, are certainly beautiful but strange to many people. Um, the, the icon literally means image, and, and the image that the iconographer is depicting is not the image that you and I see with our eye. Um, it's not an attempt to depict man in his humanity, um, but to depict him in humanity divinized, transformed in the image and likeness of God. So we don't see three-dimensional figures and statues and big muscles and so forth, because the most important thing that the, that the iconographer is trying to communicate is the divinization of the person who has is, who is transcended the, the, the uh, say, we can say, the uh, confinements even of this created order and has, has ascended to the throne of God himself. And so we depict in the icons, we see in the icons, the image and likeness of God. And they become a revelation of his incarnation in each and every one of us. Father, often when I, I have a priest as a guest, I ask the guest, the priest if he would give us a blessing as we close. Could, could I invite you to do that? Father? Of course. The blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, one last thing then, just one last pitch for the Institute. How would they contact you and what, what, what would they find if they go there? Institute of Catholic Culture uh, can part, anyone can participate live, interactive via webinar. Um, and, uh, but we also have over 900 hours of free Catholic education in our library on demand. So come there, give us a call, look us up online, Institute of Catholic Culture and everything is free of charge. Father, thank you so much for joining us on the Journey Home. Thank you. thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the Journey Home. Just like Father, in his own journey, uh, he, he said there for a while, he wondered if, if uh, he had gone so far 
that what was underneath the shell was irredeemable, uh, but he's an example. That's not, that's not true. Of course it is. We all are redeemable. Uh, if you've got any questions about the journey, uh, please contact, contact us at the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org. We'd love to stand beside you and help you discover the depth of our Lord Jesus Christ in this church. God bless you. See you again next week.